person actually put them onto the blockchain, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's a good turnout. And, and thanks very much, Hannah. That was a fantastic uh, intro. Also, especially I see now how important it is for technical people to learn about the law, and maybe also we sort of go the other way as well. So this is this is perhaps a theme. Let me make sure I get this right. Yeah. So that's just so everyone knows I'm the computer guy. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, that's my name. And here's a quote I want to start us off with. Uh, and that is really the, the flavour of this is everything is happening at once. There's, there's lawyers with trolleys full of paper at the same time as there's blockchain meetups, uh, in, you know, possibly in the same building. So it's not that we have this same technology future, uh, you know, if you see any sci-fi um, cartoons, you know, everyone is in flying cars and there's no old bridges and, you know, everything was just made last week. Well, well actually the future that we will live our lives with, all of, the, all of the little signals are here today. And so you'll probably see this stuff unfold for the next 50 years in ways that we can't imagine, but when we see it happen, we'll say, oh yeah, that's more of that. And we've probably forgotten how much things have changed. But I'm not gonna say any more, because um, my lawyer told me, until I um, give you uh, my disclaimer. Now, of course, I wanna give you enough time <laughs> to read this smart contract. There you go. Uh, um, but actually, really, uh, a priori, a bona fide ad hoc de facto alter ego de jure can, can uh, uh, veto terra nullius in, in, in toto. Uh, ergo est post facto, uh, status quo persona non grata is, is quasi ad hominem, uh, innuendo, if so facto. Uh, sui generis, you, you can subpoena an affidavit if your habeas corpus is found to be compus mentis post mortem. Uh, but mens rea is not quantum per se. Um, caveat emptor, quid pro quo, and vice versa, ad infinitum. So, obviously, that is complete nonsense, and uh, lawyers don't speak like that anymore because it's complete nonsense and the whole point of the language that, that, that Hannah was talking about is that people need to understand it. This is one of the things that's supposed to be in the case of contracts. So we've had a bit of an intro to contracts and smart contracts but I'm here to say that these smart contracts that we're talking about aren't smart, uh, at least not yet. Um, smart is a brand uh, concept we use to sell you know, electric toothbrushes um, and, and it sort of suggests that we've got artificial intelligence happening just for free. What we need to do is just take contract and, and smart and maybe we get you know, some of these sort of photos and we just say, um, job done. Uh, you know, actually, it's, it, it does, it's not magic. It doesn't, smart contracts really aren't smart. Uh, and from what I hear, although I'm not qualified to make statements of this kind, they're, not, they're also not contracts a lot of the time. Uh, the way I would describe what often is called a smart contract is actually software. Uh, smart contracts are code, and as, as you can tell from the sort of legalese you hear, uh, we, the theme of language runs through all of this. Software is made from language. Uh, it's not a language that um, everyone speaks, and it's not a language that everyone likes to communicate their feelings in, but it's certainly used for communication and uh, uh, storing information in the, in the form of concepts. So all of those ideas that are baked into the schedules of shareholder agreements are precisely the same thoughts that will occur to be baked into uh, smart contracts or software, if you want to just call it what it is. And those things will, um, those thoughts will occur the same way. People will think, oh yeah, but what about those people who only just joined the company? We don't want them to have the same as the original people. Yeah, we better create a new level, a different class. And this is exactly what software developers do all day long. You know, they take these things we call you know, domain concepts or business concepts, and we find a way to explain all that to the computer. Um, and uh, so, but what, what are we talking about? If it's not smart and it's not really a contract, uh, this is the same old thing we've been seeing for a while, uh, and it's, it's automation. So it's, it's using machines to do the jobs that people did do in the past. Um, I imagine that we could improve on those, those trolleys full of paper. Uh, you might have heard of the, um, the printer, you know, you could, uh, I don't know, apparently they're not allowed to have them in, in courtrooms. Uh, but it's not just automation, it's also disruption, which is another brand name you should be very wary of. What it really means is that 
there's a sort of a dramatic change and not everyone's on the same page. Uh, it means that people who thought things were going to go this way, they find themselves on their own and everyone went that way. This is, this is the um, future is, is here, but it's not evenly distributed. Uh, and it's also disintermediation. Being more specific here, there are people, middlemen, people who are doing a job that is really just shoveling stuff from A to B and, and we, we don't always need that to be done. I mean, I'm pretty sure that the people who drove the trucks to deliver the CDs to, from, the, from the factory that printed them to the record shops, those people aren't doing that job anymore. They're doing something else. But does that mean that they don't have a job at all? Well. If they're still j driving trucks, then there's other things to be driven. They're probably doing a lot of Amazon work now. Um, so uh, what I mean by this slide, and I like to kind of, I don't really like to make slides that you just read from. Um, so there are a lot of pictures. And I think my point here is that if you know the, the movie The Matrix, where this, this scene happens, um, it's where the main character, has everyone seen it? Put your hand up if you have not seen The Matrix. All right, good. So the world is made of rules, right, made of code, and this is a metaphor and it's a, it's a common theme of the, of the movie. The, this, is, this is really true. This is true in a legal sense and it's true in a, in a technology sense. Uh, and a lot of technologies we don't recognise because they were, they were created many uh, years before we were born. Now, a little quiz. So you know where I'm coming from here. Um, what profession focuses on constructing and interpreting logical structures in an arcane language? Uh, sometimes I'm fairly maligned and socially outcast, tend to be well paid, uh, necessary to deal with today's complex world and have a reputation for strange fashion choices. <laughs> Although not necessarily tonight. Any guesses? That's right, lawyers. <laughs> Tell me that's not a strange fashion choice. Um, so smart contracts, and I will get into some technical detail, I just want to butter you up before I do. Um, so they're, they're, smart, they're smart in some sense, they have, certainly have the capability of being smart or demonstrating the sort of subtle complexity we expect, where, you know, I know, we, we probably had the experience of um, using the coin return button on a, on a vending machine. There is some capability built in for exceptional cases, as we would call them in, uh, in software. So, well, if that didn't work, what's the, so what we call the happy path is everything works. Um, so the unhappy paths are the ones, and they can be quite numerous, are the ones where, oh, if that didn't work, then what are we going to do? So we can just go through all of those, and, and that adds complexity, but it may add sufficient value. Uh, so, so now I want to use as an example um, what, what Hannah was talking about, uh, the, the DAO. So this is, an, you know, not the DAO, um, the unfathomable force with faithful followers, um, and not the DAO, a financial concoction that derives its value from other financial instruments, but this the DAO, which is in fact both of those things, an unfathomable force with faithful followers and a financial concoction that derives its value for, from uh, other financial instruments. Um, this DAO is quite, quite interesting from that point of view. I'm, um, I'm not an investor, but of course I'm not providing investment advice. Uh, so the model was the corporation, um, the, the idea behind the corporation. Uh, for, this is the DAO I'm talking about. Uh, in fact, the original idea was called a decentralized autonomous corporation. Uh, but to, in order to make that slightly more general and perhaps hopefully, and I hope not uh, futilely, uh, sidestep some legal issues, they call it a decentralized autonomous organization. And they propose to have customers. Uh, that's obviously where they get their money from. And the, um, the customers get the value. Uh, this is a very generic term, I'm not speaking for them. They have shareholders. Uh, this is also, I think, not what they call them because there are all sorts of securities law that, um, that use terms like that. Um, and, uh, and they have contractors. These are kinds of all kinds of suppliers. So employees, suppliers, or what they call contractors. And uh, what's interesting about most corporations which also follow this is that then they have a jurisdiction in which they operate. So this is where things start to get funny because the DAO really doesn't want any of that. Uh, and it wants to also be capable of working where there is none of that. And there may be some places, I don't know, space or some places where there isn't a jurisdiction. But again, not being a lawyer, I'm not going to be the one to tell you that. So in a jurisdiction, you'll have a government typically, um, 
for some kind of governing thing to interact with. And of course, you have to pay your taxes, and that's probably the sort of significant component there. But you also have laws and regulations that, that govern the activity of that corporation. That's as much about that shit that I understand. So <laughs> now on the technical stuff. The DAO, the DAO which follows that same process, um, is actually a venture fund, really. I mean, when you look at it, it's, it's, it's pretty much a venture fund. It has collected a huge amount of ether, which is, let's just say, that's money. Um, equal current, in today's prices, that are currently about $147 million US, although earlier in the week it was over 160 something, and they're still raising money. So it has a fundraising um, uh, sort of early bird discount process where tokens like shares, uh, these are called DAO tokens, you buy them by sending your ether to an address. So just as if you were to buy a cup of coffee with, I hate the buy a cup of coffee example, beer, with Bitcoin, you, you, you know, squirt Bitcoin at the QR code. If you've ever done that, that is uh, exactly what you do in order to get in on this, which again, I'm not advocating anyone does. Uh, but obviously plenty of people have, and so you'll pay now you'll pay more than the people who paid in the beginning of the fundraising process, which is about four weeks long, I think. Uh, actually, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, but we have the code, and I can show you that. So um, it also has proportional shareholder control with very specific um, thresholds and, and ratios and equations that are in the white paper that describe it. But it also it doesn't matter what the white paper says because the code is the thing that really defines that. Uh, nobody operates the company in that sense. The, the shareholders interact with the company like they interact with any app. Uh, it has uh, quorum thresholds, so if, say, people want to liquidate the, the DAO and get their money back, they can uh, do that or they can vote to split it and vote to have money go to a certain project. And the typical process is that somebody will propose a, uh, a project. Um, they'll make a proposal and they'll say, I've got a great idea, we'll build a new version of the DAO or some modification to the DAO, we'll add some capabilities to it or um, we'll add some, some user interfaces that allow it to spit up bits of paper that satisfy Australian government standards for shareholder registers or something. And that will have some utility and the people who own it will go, yeah, no, that'll be great because then we won't get sued by those guys or whatever it is. And so they will all decide or some of them will decide, others won't care. And the, the, the software has in that smart contract all of the rules for how proposals like that one and any other one will be uh, either enacted, meaning that the, the funds will be transferred to that proposer, uh, or not, and there's a t timeout threshold, all that stuff, you can, I'll show you the details. Uh, there's also some uh, protection against what's identified as a significant potential attack, which is the majority steals from the minority attack, which is the first thing that came to my mind when I was reading it, and thinking, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna um, propose that all of the people who are watching, you know, what's happening, the, all of the, the voters, give all of their money to this new organization which will then return it all to them. Anyone who doesn't vote for that won't have given their money to this, but their money will have been given to this but on their behalf. So it will, uh, it will disadvantage those people who didn't vote for it, uh, and, uh, and so it's a, in that sense a liquidation. Uh, and as long as there's, a, there's at least someone who didn't vote, then everyone ends up with slightly more money. Um, not, I wouldn't do that, but only because I'm a nice guy and not everyone is. Um, but what is it really? And so they have some facility where they have a curator. This is someone special. I'm not sure how this is going to turn out, to be honest. But anyway, someone who can be voted out themselves is in the position to try and restrict the, the, the potential recipients of those funds in a way that, that sort of helps everyone, it um, helps the greater good. So this is a bit of a you know, special kind of role. Uh, yes, yeah, someone, well, mm, <laughs> doesn't have to be actually now you mention it. Uh, it it's someone at an address who would, um, uh, or a program, which would return a list of ad other addresses that are allowed to receive funds. So I guess, no, it's not necessarily human. I think it was intended to be, but um, the curators can be voted out and there are also rules about how curators are replaced. So they can be kicked out by the shareholders. Uh, and in fact, they can be, crucially, they can be kicked out faster than the process for, for voting on a proposal. So here is what you'd uh, see at a um, software architect's whiteboard, roughly. You know, no more boxes than about this number to understand any given system, otherwise it's too complicated. And this is about the complexity 
of the DAO. As software, it is very, very simple. It is um, about 1200 lines of code written in a new language called Solidity, which is being created for Ethereum for the purpose of writing smart contracts and also what they call dApps, distributed apps, um, which are really just composed of contracts. But all of this is just software, right? You know what apps are, you know what an app store is. They got all the same stuff. Uh, a token, which is a DAO token, this is a share. Token creation is a bit of the system which assists and manages the process of um, issuing the shares with the, with the ramp that I described, the price, the early bird bonus and the linear progression of price to the sort of plateau point where they say, okay, now, that, now it's finished and after that, that, that token creation is not used. This interesting I th thing I want to draw, distinction I want to draw here is that there's the DAO, the DAO, the one that has made all that money, but there is this contract that can be used by anyone. Like we could tonight say, you know what, let's do a DAO. We're gonna get on the blower and call all our friends and say it's a great idea, we know what we're doing. And we have our own, we can have our own numbers for all of this stuff. We could just use their contract, use their code, they've provided it and it's open source, we're allowed to use it. But we would then have different, different thresholds and numbers for all of these things. So just like um, your Angry Birds high score list is different to mine because you've got a different instance of that software. Uh, the DAO itself, that's where the meat is, or well, most of it. Um, there's, a, there's another little thing, I'll skip that. There's a proposal I mentioned. This is a di slightly different kind of object in the system, but it's like a piece of data, um, and, I'll, and I'll show you that. Uh, and it has a managed account. These are just parts, part of the administration of uh, this system. So, so it is software, it is, it is a system designed to, let's say, simulate a company in the way that uh, Hannah was describing. Is it really a company? Is it really, are they really contracts? Well. I don't know, really, who cares? This does the work of a company, it is real work, and people value this ether that it operates with at a, at a quite a high, well, higher than the US dollar. So, I mean, there are, what, $13, $14 each, an ether, um, you know, cryptocurrency. So it's real enough in that sense, but um, what, what is the difference between simulation and reality? This is computer software. If you treat it as real, it is real, just like the matrix. But to give you an idea of how small this is, 1200 lines of Solidity code, that might take someone, it could take, I mean, you really don't know, it could take a month, something like that, for some one person to do, or it could be sort of slammed out in a day if, if you were really lucky and you knew what you were doing, but I'd say this is probably somewhere in between that amount of work. Could be six months, but I doubt it. Uh, but, but the, and so, in comparison, the smallest uh, chess playing AI that I know of is about a hundred lines of code. So that's smaller than this. But there really isn't very much software of note that is. The average iPhone app is about 50,000 lines of code. So, so orders of magnitude, an order of magnitude larger. Um, the space shuttle code, that's getting on a bit now. The whole program's been shut down. But the amount of code that made that whole thing possible, the actual space shuttle, is about 400,000 lines of code. Now, you shouldn't read too much of these in, you can't compare them side by side, it's different programming languages, but just the number of zeros in these numbers is really worth uh, looking at. Photoshop, a recent version of that, it's about five million lines of code. Facebook, about 60 million. Uh, a modern car, have a guess. I'm going up, so I've sort of given it away. A hundred million lines of code. Can you believe that? Like that's more than, you know, most software systems that we've that we had ever worked with until maybe 10 years ago and now a car has that much code in it um, and then going uh, going up a little bit from there is a mouse an actual organism a mouse the um, the the mouse dna uh, genome base pairs if you wrote them all out uh, 120 million lines of that um, so, you know, in terms of information content, a mouse is, a mouse's DNA is no more complex um, than 120 million lines of well, those base pairs. Um, all of Google, who wants to guess this one? 100 billion. 100 billion? Oh, no, it's, it's 2 billion. No one has gone to 100 billion, but that's across a lot of different projects and people don't know anything about the other ones. So, but 2 billion lines of code is a very, very sizable amount of engineering. So if you're talking about lawyers making contracts larger and adding complex clauses for things, this is exactly the same thing as we're talking about here with software code. So let's code. 
I'm going to show you, um, oh, let me make sure this works. This is generally regarded to be a completely bad idea to do live coding, to look at code. So I'm not actually going to try and make novel code work, but I am going to show you the code of, uh, of the DAO. Um, so we have, oh. um, can everyone see this stuff? Now you're not expected to understand it all, certainly if you haven't done any programming before, but I just want to give you a sense of the flavor of it. So the gray stuff is just, co just comments written for human beings to understand it. Um, so uh, the, the colorful stuff tends to be active um, things that the computer will understand. You can see the first word here is contract. That says what we're defining is a contract. This is like the, the, the atom that you work with, the, the element that you create. And you give it a name, it's a to it's token interface. I'm not gonna look at, show you everything, but you can see you've got a similar structure here, contract DAO interface. Uh, and when it has, in this particular example, and actually I should say this, this possibly may not pass code review where I'm from, but uh, this is how they've done it. Um, it, uh, it has a, a convention which, if, which interface, when it says interface, it's more of a declaration, this is what we're going to do, and then when it doesn't have interface after it, it's actually doing it. Um, here is a list of the things I was talking about before. Remember the color is the active code and the, the gray, if it comes out for you at the back, the gray, um, which has these slash slash uh, characters at the beginning, uh, isn't it's just a note for, for anyone who happens to be reading it. And there's lots of notes in here because it is intended that people would learn from it. So here is a thing called creation grace period, 40 days. So we can make, if we wanted to make our own, we could just type in here and make it, oh, let's make it more, 140 days. This will change the behavior of that contract. Um, now you can actually, probably what I should do is like not say, spare you from, from going through any more of this because like I said, there's about 1,200 lines here. Oh, here's a proposal. Uh, the recipient, the person, oh, um, this is a, the stuff to do with the, cr the curator. Um, the amount, this is all talking about an amount of ether. This is the currency that it works with. Is the proposal still open? Has it been voted on and is it, has it been accepted or, or rejected? Uh, this is a bull, which is a which is true false value. So we're saying there's a true false property of this thing, and if it can only be true or false, um, and, it, and if it's true, it indicates that it can be voted on. If it's false, it indicates that the voting is finished or has been cancelled. So I won't go through any more, but we can certainly look and see exactly how this works. Uh, this is one programming language, and it's only one way to write uh, smart contracts. And there's another way which excites people, um, and that is using a thing they're calling Etherscriptor. That language, by the way, is called Solidity, and it's a bit, bit similar to JavaScript. If you've ever heard of Java or JavaScript, they just have names um, based that, that help you understand where they get their, their conventions from, and um, so the conventions there follow that family of programming languages, and there are many thousands of programming languages, and many hundreds that are in popular use today. This is possibly not even a programming language, although um, that's debatable, but it, it certainly is a thing for defining smart contracts and it matches closely the structure of that code. And the way it works is just like Lego, you can drag these things around. These things are comments, that's a note, and it just says insurance policy. And I can just edit this. Insurance policy for, uh, for, for a mortgage. Say, and we could sort of make this work for a mortgage. You can change all the values, but not only that, you can unplug bits, take this over here and say, no, in the, not in the save slot called Arbiter, put this thing, which happens to be an address. This is like a recipient, it could be a contractor or a person. Not in the save slot, but in the temp slot. Um, this is another piece of puzzle plug stuff. We can go, oh, actually, uh, we want to get here, we want to get the contract caller uh, and put, and put the, that in there. So you can see how I can drag and drop chunks of logic that only fit in certain places because the shape of this puzzle piece uh, restricts it. And, um, and here's, oh, so you can see here's, 
here's an example of it says or um, when, so this is a condition, or meaning either of these two possible outcomes, the contract caller equals, like that could be not equals or less than or whatever, data that's sitting at the save slot called arbit arbitrator, arbitrator, um, or the contract caller equals the data at the save slot called claim adjuster. So what this is in English, if the arbitrator or the claim adjuster, so English is much easier, um, but it's less precise and the computer can't speak English, um, then you get this stuff. So you can sort of see that this uh, cuddles this other block of stuff and I can pull that out. Um, where was I? Yeah, so from here down, this is what happens when those two things are true. So this is, maybe this is less hostile than the code I was showing you before, but this sucks too. I mean, it, you know, imagine trying to work with this, but, but what we're gonna see increasingly is that you'll have technical lawyers and lawyery technical people and they'll form this superhuman uh, who, will, who will rule the world in the future. That is almost certain, I think, because this is, this is not only does this accurately describe, say, to us, I mean, just grant me that, some kind of insurance policy. Let's just say that's true. It's way better than that. This actually implements, executes that insurance policy completely hands-free, automatically. Nobody needs to be involved except at the designated exit points. And these here, arbitrator, claim adjuster, uh, these are, um, in this particular example, happen to be things where the contract uh, calls out and says, hey, what ha human, help me answer this. Which way do we go here? Because the, the contract's reached a point where human judgment's required. You know, press one to, you know, whatever it might be. I don't know, but uh, it can certainly work like that. That'd be horrific in some ways, but certainly um, it, it could be a lot more efficient for a lot of different kinds of uh, uh, sort of business scenario that are currently handled very slowly and very expensively with lawyers who, um, who could be doing something less automatable. So that is actual code uh, and um, we, can, you can, we can get into um, uh, some questions about that if you like. Let me just, I can only do one thing at a time and it's going to be use my computer. So I just showed you uh, Solidity, the programming language, and Etherscriptor, and I'll give you links to these things if you want to go and play with them. There's another, there's a number of examples. One of them is a Tooth Fairy example, so some of them are quite fun. Um, now this is uh, how Ethereum, which is what, this, this is the system that all of this works on. You, you know Bitcoin, Bitcoin has a blockchain, that's where all the Bitcoin are, that's where the transaction records are. Ethereum is not Bitcoin, it's another thing. And what runs Ethereum for, for a software developer is the Ethereum virtual machine. Now that's a, uh, a it's, it's not a physical machine, it's a software based machine. Um, and this is how distributed apps or contracts are made. And on Ethereum it runs bytecode. So really you don't, your contract, if, if you had a bug in that little drag and drop thing in Etherscriptor and it created a contract that, that wasn't right, there would be a problem in the machine like the, like the vending machine doesn't give you chocolate, it gives you chips, and that is going to happen some proportion of the time because all software has bugs. But the real thing that, that, that runs, the real thing that runs the contract is called, is called bytecode, and it's not what I showed you. It's more complex, it's much closer to what I showed you in the, in the very beginning, the big hex dump. Um, so that's, it's good to know that the reality down there where it actually defines the behavior of the machine and executes the contract isn't what I showed you. That's, a, that gets, that's written for humans to, to make these smart contracts and if there's a problem in translation, then you'll get a problem there. Now that, that machine has been built with programming languages like C++ and Go and, and Python and there are multiple implementations of it. On top of that is another layer called low level language. So you can write this, it's more tedious than um, what I just showed you before, uh, hostile, user hostile you might say, but it's closer to the metal or closer to the <coughs> virtual machine. So it's, it's a closer match for what really actually you mean in your contract um, when it gets executed. Low level language. On top of that you have what are, well, I guess you call them high level languages, Solidity, and there's another one I didn't show you called Serpent. Actually, you know what, I can show you it because it's what's really cool about 
um, that. Again, one thing at a time. Uh, this, this thing can can show you those. So this contract, actually, it may not work so well because I've just messed it up. Oh, no, that just looks well formed. Uh, serpent, this is the corresponding serpent code that, that goes with that. So you don't have to write serpent. If you want to write it with blocks, you can write it with blocks and it will translate it into serpent. And there is it translated into low-level language. So I don't know, if you're not technical, they probably look pretty much the same. Uh, but anyway, the idea is that this is much closer to the, ins the, the pure instructions that this Ethereum virtual machine executes. Who's, who's not with me right now at all? Oh, you sure? That would be unusual. Everyone's with me, that's great. Okay, good. I'll, um, uh, one thing at a time. And So I was climbing this... Um, Stack, we call it a stack, where things are built on top of other things. Low-level language, solidity, and there will be others. There are others. Um, so Etherscriptor you could put in there. Actually, you could probably put Etherscriptor on top of Serpent because it generates Serpent. Uh, and that one's a little bit like Python, if you've heard of the Python programming language. This one has curly braces like JavaScript. And, and this is what you write your smart contracts in. So. Uh, this is the, the sort of the stack. You, you're working here and you don't have to worry about down here. Just like you drive your car, you didn't have, don't have to worry about pressing metal or, or constructing tires or the melting glass or anything. That's handled beno, below your uh, level of, of abstraction, we call it. And an uh, important thing to note is that smart contracts don't create AI by, themse by themselves. But the, but the world we're going to have here, and I'll sort of make sure I leave enough time for questions, but the world we're going to have here is, is going to contain some problems. Uh, I'm quite an optimistic person about technology, but I think it's really important that we all engage with technology so that we don't end up with something horrific. Um, and, it, and being literate about it uh, is going to help us because we all know this situation where even if you are dealing with a person, so obviously we're talking about replacing whether they're lawyers or, or people at snack bars, um, you know, selling you chocolates over the counter and you can say, no, no, not chips, chocolate, uh, and, and maybe get your money back if it tastes bad. You're going to, even if you're dealing with a person, you're going to often be, often be faced with a person who themselves only has a computer to deal with on the other side of some, some gap, like the phone line or whatever. You know, you, you go through the... You go through the phone system and push one and push two and you, you can't get any joy there because you're not important enough to speak to an actual person because they're, they're too highly paid. And then you do get to speak to a person and they can't help you because they don't actually do anything. They don't actually make the stuff happen. It's all done by a computer and they're just hearing you in their ear and they've just got the computer and they're just using the computer for you. You know, that's, uh, that's really what's happening. And so what I, while that's terrible, and I, as a computer uh, guy, will say that's terrible, um, the solution is for us to engage with technology and understand it a bit more and direct it to uh, go the way we want, we want it to go. So coming back to smart contracts, uh, I think today smart contracts are better than contract contracts under sp certain specific situations today. And I would say this is uh, in a sort of growing area. Uh, marginal activity is uh, probably a, a weasel word for this, but um, uh, let's say things that might not all be legal, um, uh, like buying and selling bubble gum in Singapore, you know? Um, <laughs> that's illegal, that's um, not allowed. Or, or even if it's legal, but it's still problematic. Like in the US, I've heard there's a lot of you know, medical cannabis sort of companies that can't get bank accounts and stuff because they've seen as a risk category and nobody wants to touch them. Um, also, uh, places where law breaks down is where there isn't reliable law. And actually, you could sort of say the criminal underworld as well. I mean, this is a massive industry. There are lots of uses for the technology that are, that are illegal. Um, so if we're, if we're interested in the potential rise and de further development of this technology, we can't pretend that that doesn't exist. I mean, the Silk Road is a perfect example of a, of a thing that, that grew, the, grew Bitcoin uh, while 
uh, support being supported by uh, it's, this is an underground drug market. Everyone has heard the news about it, right? That's why we have to use the term blockchain now. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't buy your drugs with blockchain, did you? You bought them with Bitcoin. That's that <laughs> done. Uh, and um, so, so, w but it, those, those exist, and the sort of the, the black market and the grey market, you know, rip off Nike shoes or whatever they might be. You know, this stuff they can't necessarily get the full protection of law, and but they certainly. Um, you know, smart contracts work just as well in those places. Uh, also, where you have long ta a long tail, um, my favorite example of this is YouTube. You know, here's an idea for a business. We're going to get random video from loads of teenagers and we're just going to put it online and people are going to watch that instead of professional grade TV. And the funniest thing is that it, they, they do. So <laughs> I have teenagers and that's exactly what they watch. But uh, yeah, so the long tail, there's a very much larger pool of people who can participate as long as you're dealing with a mass market, low cost, you know, one size fits all kind of product and legal uh, services don't go there. Uh, so um, smart contracts potentially could. Also internationally, I think smart contracts might go across jurisdictions in a way that, again, this is a lawyer question, but you know, maybe there are some I mean, it's certainly easier if you're just talking about Australia, you know what laws you're dealing with, you know what the law is, you, everyone is on the same page. Sometimes we're not on the same page or even on the same continent. Um, also in situations where you're going experimental, I put the, the DAO in this uh, case, where people are pushing, the re innovating the realm. This is the innovation hub, right? So when you're trying to make new stuff, you want to look at stuff. Well, what if everything was digital? We don't want to deal with chocolate because that's just that's got to do with atoms, not bits. So we'll do what about um, music? Yeah, music or video games. Yeah, you can do video games. You can have artists contribute the art. You have musicians and people who make the sound effects and people who write the code and people who test it and all of this stuff. And nobody provides anything through the mail. They're, everything they do is through the computer. It's all digital. And then when the customers buy the product, that's digital too. This is where you'll see smart contracts provide a lot more bang for buck because they don't have to, you don't need to worry about Internet of Things. You don't need to worry about turning off someone's car in the middle of the freeway. You know, those, the reality, the physical reality is quite messy and we can make things quite neat if we just stick to the digital realm and then work out how it works there. I mean, we do, you know, who doesn't have a smartphone in their pocket right now? You know, it's going to be a minority. That has shown us that we can, there's a lot of value in the pure digital world. We, uh, we like it. Maybe, um, you know, in space, contra smart contracts work there too. And I just want to end with this. I think this is a serious thing. Smart contracts will replace lawyers, but not smart lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
So this contract, which is written out in words, because it has to fulfill this, has to be printed on paper, has to have the seal, has to have whatever, fine. Connect the printer, load up the paper, we'll print some stuff. You know, so software is totally capable of writing software. In fact, if you think about it, that's exactly what I demonstrated with the, with the draggy droppy thing, generating code. We could put a loop on that and generate as much code as you want. Whether it does what you want, that's where your problem is. And that is probably something where those high paid super people who are both lawyers and technical will, will come in because they'll be able to solve that problem. But it's an ongoing problem. That's sort of my question. Uh, the bytecode is like ground truth for a lot of smart contract use, but you know, people don't have the capacity to understand the bytecode. That's my question. I guess yeah. So for Anna, was, um, yeah. is, that, is that a problem for, you know, does that make smart contracts inherently not legal? If they don't understand it, so yeah, except in practice what's going to happen is that the tools that I was showing you, the things that generate the, the bytecode, if they are not 99.999% reliable, then they won't be used. And in fact, they will be that reliable because software, the way it's, the interesting thing about software is that through use, it becomes more reliable generally, unless you dramatically change it. But if you could use fix the bugs. But physical <coughs> machinery, this that's virtual machinery, physical machinery becomes less reliable through use. So the software will, will increasingly approach what we want it to do. And so you'll, you'll come to rely on the, um, the top layers and that the things underneath will not fail anywhere near enough of the time. Because if I showed you all of the layers that are in your current, in your pocket, like how many bits of technology and that nobody knows all of them. And if I showed you that list where every layer has to rely on every other layer all the way down, it would be massive, hundreds of layers you could draw. That's a typical thing we ask in uh, interview questions as well. Oh, it's a comment about that particular issue. There's a company in Singapore working on that problem of taking smart contracts and converting them back into documents that the government understands. I think it's called legalese. <coughs> so I don't know how yep. far they're talking about, but I mean, it's a yep. big task, but there is someone working on that. Yes, someone's going to make a lot of money building software that does that because this is the bridge. But this is, it's, like the, it's like printing out GPS coordinates. Sometimes you're not going to like what you get. You might end up with something that's unwieldy. Um, but certainly you can, you can generate, from, from that contract you can generate uh, English, sure. But it, but it won't be like someone speaking to you. It will be a computer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it'll be like that Lego. But you know, this is going to be an ongoing problem, but it already is a problem. And that was what, well, that's why I said all that stupid Latin junk, because we can see that it's a problem when, when we have specialist language that's formal, and that's exactly what computer code is. But we can all learn it. Like, you don't have to all become pro career programmers, but you can just, you've just, anyone who's been exposed to something new tonight has just gone, oh, okay, I learned that one little bit more. That'll help, because also you'll help us. Um, make it easier to use by complaining in the right time. <laughs> Another question? The Solidity programming language, what was some of the reasoning behind coming up with a new language? What were some of the features from other languages that were moved or do you have new features? Uh, they wanted to, well, there's two answers. One is um, they wanted to have something that was, clo that was closer to the language of contracts, so that where it said things that uh, I'm trying not to use too much sort of lingo here, but that what we would call native or something that belongs to the problem domain. It belongs to the domain of we've got, it's, it is still technical, like we've got Ethereum. Ethereum has addresses. Addresses are right there in the language. You can use an address. Um, you've got a contract. You, you don't create a class, which what you might do in a programming language. You create a contract. Uh, you have... Um, yeah, an address in there is something that's special. Now, you, an address in Ethereum happens to be a super big number. It's a 256-bit number, which means that if you wrote it in ones and zeros in binary, it would have 256 digits, bits. Uh, so uh, that's a big number, but it's not just a number because numbers you can multiply together. Addresses, you never want to multiply them together. If you made a programming language that just enabled you to have 256-bit numbers and you could do whatever you want with them, someone might add one to another one, and that would have a guaranteed meaningless result. So why not make it impossible and have a thing called an address? So that brings you closer from general purpose programming to, to, to the special purpose of contracts. One last question. So with smart contracts, uh, where you've got contracts that can interact with other contracts, uh, and they've got financial class as well, 
care to comment on maybe emergent uh, intelligence? Yeah, um, not quickly though. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, the problem, this is why I said it's not magic. It's this, there's nothing that new in having a smart contract programming language. So we've got programming languages. The, the, this is a point that uh, Hannah and I were talking about, you know, like AI is often brought up here. So on one hand, AI is impossible, right? And, and the reason I say that is because we don't know what intelligence means. One, at one time, it was, uh, if you can do calculations, you're intelligent. Well, then when computers started doing calculations, they said, no, 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 that's not it. It's being able to play chess. Well, that got wiped out too. So we keep moving the goalposts because when we in face a computer, we're going, it's not, it's very quick, but it's so dumb, you know? And we know that because what, what we're using is it's not human, right? It's not, it's not, doesn't have a face and stuff like that. That's just where we're going with this emergent high intelligence. So in that sense, it's impossible. The other side of saying is we've already got AI, okay? Because AI is happening layer by layer, increasing the sophistication of our systems now to a billion lines for Google. Google is pretty, it seems to know what you want a lot of the time. I mean, it's quite good, isn't it? I mean, that's better than some people I know, you know? <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, the, so the question is, can a computer do this as well as a human can do this? And when this is drive a car, that's what we're talking about these days. 20 years ago, it was like play chess, you know? So we're just gonna keep on coming up with these new things to automate. And this has been going, out through, going on throughout history since you know, the invention of the wheel. You know, we don't need people to carry stuff anymore. Yeah, <laughs> we're smart in front of it. Um, thank you everyone, thank you Chris. And <laughs> get up, have a stretch, talk to the person next to you, and we'll see you across the park.